Okay, so today we're going to kind of jump again to a different topic and we're going to talk a little bit about different design model guidelines and uh, different ways to use AVM that we uh, may not have had a chance to talk about before. So let me begin by talking a little bit about elaborated and realistic models. And what I mean by that is that many of the ABMs we've looked at, like the flocking and the segregation and uh, the ANTS model, are very, very simple models, right? Uh, they have simple rules, and those rules interact uh, in interesting ways to create elaborate patterns. Elaborate and realistic models are in some ways the opposite end of the spectrum, right? These are models that have maybe a whole variety of mechanisms. They might use empirical data. They might match a variety of outcomes. And in some ways, they're more easily falsifiable because if the model doesn't match up with real data patterns as they unfold, right, then we know there's something wrong with them, right? And so they have a lot of benefits to them. So you could imagine, for instance, a shelling model uh, that was aimed at matching Chicago's urban patterning, right? Like they would show how over time, how people decided to live in different parts of the city, for instance, right? And as opposed to the shelling model, which is this very simple idealistic model. Right? Um, and so you might have things like public transportation thrown into there. You might have other factors that were not in the, the shelling model, right? Um, and look at how those relate. You might have empirical data like uh, census data over time. Uh, and you might be able to match a variety of different outcomes like uh, future development patterns and things like that, right? Uh, but the problem with ER models, elaborate realistic models, is that they're highly contingent, right? They're really kind of usually built for a particular setting or a particular time. As a result of that, they may not be very generalizable to other settings and other times, right? And they can also be difficult to understand, right? If you throw in all those different mechanisms, how do you know what mechanism is really driving your model outcomes, right? Uh, so I think of this as a, you know, so in some ways this made off to be this trade-off between simple and elaborated realistic models, but I think that's a false dichotomy. There's no reason why you have to build either a simple model or an elaborated realistic model. Instead, you can think about something like pattern-oriented modeling, for instance. Um, so there's this great paper by Grimm and colleagues where they argue that one model uh, should be able to replicate different levels of granularity. And if it does, then that's a good indication that that model is actually telling us something true about the way the world works, right? Uh, so this could entail that a, a model that is both elaborated realistic and also simple and generalizable, right? It could be that you have some sort of simple pattern of outcomes that you can observe from the model, but it can also make specific predictions about how an individual or a group of individuals might behave, right? But such a singular perfect model might be difficult to create. So we actually espouse uh, something that we call full spectrum modeling. And full spectrum modeling is the idea that rather than creating a single model to both be a simple description of phenomenon you're observing and at the same time making specific predictions about, say, land development in Chicago, right, that you create a suite of models they explore the different concepts at different levels, right? And if you build those models on top of each other, right, then they gain the benefits of each of them along the way. So the simple models can explore the necessity and importance of the mechanism, while the elaborated and realistic models can be used to explore specific instances and make particular forecasts, right? You might think of this as a set of, uh, of, of Russian nesting dolls, right? Where they, where one of the simple model is embedded in terms of a complex model in terms of a more complex model, right? And this always reminds me a little bit of the saying uh, by Faulkner and others, uh, uh, many others, that say that, you know, you should kill your darlings. Right? They should take the model, the parts of, in their case, they're talking about writing, right? And they mean take things that you've written in the past and just throw them away and rewrite them from the ground up, right? So what I'm arguing for in many ways is that you can take simple models, take more detailed models. You don't have to throw them away in our case, right? But create a brand new model that kind of epitomizes a lot of the things that you were trying to explain in the other model. And over time, you'll create a suite of these models, right? And you'll have a different set of models. And in fact, the um, ABM design principle that we talked about um, in Unit 4, which is to build uh, the simplest possible model that helps you answer a question, right? Start as simply as possible and build toward a question. This is kind of designed for that, right? You build that simple model, you get some sort of answer, 
throw it away. Don't even look at it again. Build the next level of model, right? Then over time, you'll now have a set of models, a suite of models to explore the question that you're interested in at different levels of detail and different levels of granularity. Uh, so that's the basic idea behind full spectrum modeling. Uh, I hope you uh, kind of think about that as you're building your own models. So let's talk about another um, uh, modeling design philosophy, and these are not uh, new, these two philosophies are not contradictory for each other. In fact, they complement each other really well. Um, you know, a typical modeling setup is that you have two groups of researchers. You have a subject matter expert group and you have a model implementer group. This will also be you yourself as you're working on developing a model where you're sometimes spending some time researching the subject matter and you're sometimes spending some time building the model, right? Regardless, the typical approach is you design the model using your subject matter expertise. Um, you then build the model, right, based upon that design. You then present your, you compare the results back to the original model, right? And that's kind of the basic framework that a lot of, of systems um, work under, a lot of model designs work under. But I, I think that has a number of different problems. First of all, you know, model designs when initially drafted are rarely complete, which means that the model implementer has to make a lot of decisions about how to fully specify that model design, right? Um, the, and these design and those, and those implementation issues could be correct or they could be not what the original model designers think should be done, right? Um, also, early results can have dramatic implications. You could be playing around with a model saying, oh, well, you know, if I put this mechanism in, everything goes to kind of a quiescent state, a state where nothing really happens. So I shouldn't put that mechanism in. So, the, so as a result of that, right, you might be by the time you get to the final analysis that the final model now looks nothing like the original model was designed, right? Um, also, you know, the lack of communication between model designers and model implementers results in a lack of understanding about how the model works, right? I personally believe that you should never get up and just say, our model shows this, um, and I don't know why, right? And that's an interesting phenomenon, right? Because it's not. If you, if you haven't had taken the time to figure out why your model shows the results you have, right, then you don't really understand what that model is actually doing, right? What the, how the model is actually generating results. Model designers need to understand why the model shows that. You should never be able to say that's what the model shows and just stop the conversation, right? Um, you need to be able to go one level deeper and understand why the model shows those results. So all this together kind of pushes for a modeling philosophy known as iterative modeling. And, uh, and this idea is important for the model designer and implementer to communicate early and often, right? And so the new modeling life cycle is that you, the model designer works with the implementer to specify a minimal model. The model implementer then implements that minimal model and the results are communicated back. Now, as a result of the results, you might define, uh, design, modify the model design in some way in order to uh, better capture the phenomenon of interest. Or it might be possible that you now know, hey, there's this parameter that we need to put into this model that we don't know what that value should be. Maybe the model, the subject model expert should go out and collect some data in order to understand that, right? Uh, then once you've done all that, you then expand the minimal model in a minimal amount, right, minimally, uh, and you repeat the process again, right. The idea is that you should be able to fail fast. Try something out, show it to the designer. If it's right, maybe they'll be able to say yes, it's right right away. If it's not, you then need to go back and reconsider it, right. And this also allows for something called just-in-time uh, model construction, right. Um, so if you're working hard to meet a deadline, right, and you're using the iterative modeling approach, you can usually wrap up and say, hey, you know, we're going to freeze the model right now, we're going to see what it says, and then uh, we'll continue this process after uh, we're done with the presentation, paper, whatever the, the deadline was for, right? So that's the basic uh, idea behind iterative modeling, and I think that it works well, especially in conjunction with full spectrum modeling.